Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. And as usual, with me today is Rob Hirschfeld. How are you, Rob? I'm doing quite well, Stephen. Enjoying the dog days of summer. Yeah, it's, we're, we're actually going to see 90 degrees here for the first time this summer, which isn't bad for late June, so I'll take that. And, uh, Austin, please, you guys must be in the hundreds already. I don't like I, Yeah, I, you know, I don't like triple digits, so I just switch everything to hex, and it's all better. <laughs> That's great. Well, our guest today is uh, Jason Hoffman, the CEO of Mobile Edge X, continuing our, you know, our deep dive into Edge. And uh, Jason, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Jason, let's uh, do a quick overview about yourself. If we can keep it under 15, 20 minutes, that would be perfect. And then uh, from there, we can go on. <laughs> a quick. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, it'll be significantly lower than 15 to 20 minutes. I mean, currently I'm running Mobile Edge X and we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom. So, you know, the German telco that owns mobile brands like T-Mobiles globally and so on. We are focused on developer-facing edge services. So largely everything that's needed from a back-end perspective for people that are doing interesting things on existing devices and people that are trying to make new devices uh, possible. Uh, one of the few, if not only, product development you know, focused companies within the group that's uh, largely trying to make all you know, the, the realistic things from an edge context possible. Previously, uh, you know, I spent you know, about four years running uh, the infrastructure and platform business at uh, Ericsson out of Sweden. Did a decade, the founder and CTO of a, a company called Joyent. Before that, largely was doing scientific computing. Joyent, for people who, who aren't familiar, has some incredible claim, claims to fame. And it, it worth pointing out briefly, just to, it, it, Jason doesn't really need anybody to prove his street cred, but... Joint was built on Sol open, Solaris, ultimately open Solaris, and was using zones, which most people would now consider containers, ten, a full 10 years before anybody thought that that was a good idea. Well, the, the um, sad part is we, they were called containers back then, too. Uh, but, <laughs> but yes, we, uh, in 2005, we launched the first uh, container as a service uh, platform. That's true. Uh, and we launched the world's first uh, serverless platform a year and a half before Lambda. And then when Lambda finally came out, the only runtime they supported was the runtime we did, which was Node.js. So it was, uh, no, we have the, um, the wonderful distinction of being the, the founder and CTO of Cloud's Amiga. <laughs> and, and to me, this, this is <laughs> maybe, maybe the doom of Edge in, in those two statements, because Edge is, Jason, if you're there, it's 10 years too early, right? That's sort of the definition? Yep. Or is, or, exactly or, or, right. or is Edge, is edge going to arrive this time in time for us? No, no, no. I mean, if you look at the, you know, honestly, but, I, but you know, now, now that I'm older and wiser, I have a much better sense of uh, time, timing, and timeliness, you know, than perhaps before. And, uh, you know, also a general appreciation that people want things that are easy to consume and, and very accessible and something that's for them and what they need right then. You know, it's important when you go and do new products. On one hand, it's good to be capable of being an end user of what you're doing, but then on the, the other hand, it's super easy to sit around and only talk about things that are for you and people like you, and you may be more niche than you basically realize, right? So, I mean, you know, if you go back to say, yeah, 2006, 2007, you know, I mean, it was uh, writing things like, you know, Amazon's EC2 is, is not ready for, you know, any enterprise applications and, and so on like that, because there's transient IP addresses and uh, no persistent storage and an average half-life of two hours before they crash. And, you know, you really have to go after a cloud that has all those types of features and it's available right now and available only in pro mode and high performance region and, and a little bit more expensive, you know, because who doesn't want to pay for performance? And the reality is, you know, it, it becomes... Um, a, a challenge to sort of sit down and say, you know, how do we, how do we sort of cross over sometimes from pro mode, uh, high powered, 
you know, type things to really things that are much more sort of mass and general market from that, from that perspective. I want to, I want to dig in a little bit on the timing side, because I, I want to, for us, we'll skip, we'll skip past the what is edge and things like that, or we'll get back to it. Timing is a, is a huge factor, right? We're, we're mm-hmm. talking about edge infrastructure that, that doesn't, ex, doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Uh, edge devices do. How do we jumpstart a market? How's, how do we get the time right? Because it, it doesn't feel to me like we're, we're there yet, right? There's missing huge gaps, right? We talk about this in, the, on, in other episodes all the time. Yeah. Whole categories of platform that don't exist. What's, what, how, do we, how do we make sure that we're not five years too early? It's a great question. I mean, I think some, some questions I, I ask around here are, and I'm just going to add some questions to your question as a way of answering your questions before we really answer the question. Oh, yeah. I promise I'll answer the question. Is the past instructive in this case? How the internet happened, we have how mobile networks happened, we have an understanding of what type of device on a mobile network won at the end of the day. Hint, it's an iPhone and smartphones. We have how cloud happened and why and when and where and how it was started with web to mobile to general enterprise and everything else. We have what what people do on smartphones versus older phones and the fact that we were doing voice and messaging and consumption of media and, and so on. And then the question really for whether you think of the last 15 years, 20 years, 25 years across the emergence of the internet and uh, mobile and mobility and smartphones and mobile apps and web apps and, and everything else is what of that is instructive in the future because in a lot of ways and I'll, and I'll give you a quick example of this you know in the mobile operator space there were a lot of cloud initiatives they were done in the enterprise groups the first offer they came up came out with and generally like that was you know we're going to offer you know virtual machines as a as a service and we're going to go offer them to the enterprise and then we'll offer something that's near like a vpn and the enterprise guys came out with that and they sort of missed the fact that all the people they were basically targeting in the normal customer base weren't, weren't the people that were going off and using, say, an Amazon Web Services back then. Coming out with a, a virtual machine first uh, as your service is not a compelling, interesting offer at all. I mean, it was the, the fifth thing that showed up at Amazon Web Services. For years, the only use case was batch compute processing of logs and image conversion and so on and things in S3. You know, they're really sort of killer services that showed up on, you know, something like an Amazon Web Services. In, in my opinion, the first one was, was Amazon S3. I mean, in the sense of even when Amazon S3 showed up, we put joint customers like WordPress.com and Twitter and LinkedIn. We stuck all those guys on S3 because it, it solved a very simple, non-obvious problem for most web developers. And that was that most of what web developers had no idea how to reliably store like an image on a disk. You so know, do, and, do, we, so. do we have the equivalent? Do you think we, we have the equivalent from an edge use case perspective? That sort of simple story that, you know, is going to sort of propagate edge? I, uh, it's a, it's, that's also a great question, and uh, I, I, think, I think so. We're working on aspects of that, and let, let's come back to that because um, a big obsession this time around for myself has been how can we anchor edge into things that we can do right now, this year, you know, for people that already exist and they're already around, and, you know, what, what really can we be doing? Do you mean that from the sense of – a lot of these edge use cases, edge devices, are either phoning home to a cloud infrastructure or just on-premises infrastructure already, and we're just we're, we're fixing the model. Can you break that down a little bit for me? Because I could see a couple ways. Yeah, and I, I think the there's apps, a the apps are there. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a there's a couple parts. There's a couple parts to it, and and also just close out on the the last one and just a little bit would be that you know the past being instructive in the future, like like say the fact that you know we're subsidiary of a telecom. If cloud and the telecom space in 2007 was done as the foundational platform for LTE and the rollout of LTE and the supporting of the iPhone, 
that would have been very different, a very different world. And if, if the idea being that the people that we need to support or the people that are making smartphones and the people that are putting things on smartphones and, and what should be additional services that we can be putting on the infrastructure to serve that, that user base, it's a very, very, very different thing than pursuing an, a uh, VM-based enterprise cloud offering as part of your large enterprise division type sort of thinking. For, for this, you know, it's not a coincidence that you know, we, we've, we've been calling this mobile edge for us in that now we're to the, the latest question. People like things that are wireless, cordless, hands-free, no touch. You know, if we could somehow, there's always a preference for that. And, and, I, the, only, and the only people that sort of don't prefer it, things where, uh, you know, like I, I have a set of headphones that I put into a really nice vacuum tube based, you know, amp at home that have to be on a wire you know, the type, type sort of thing. But, but at the same time, you know, I, I like wireless noise canceling headphones when I travel because it's a pain to have, you know I mean? So I think there's a very pragmatic piece here that's worth sort of highlighting because the people have trouble conceptualizing the scale that we talk about with edge. And if you had to create a physical wire to each thing in your edge infrastructure, in your house or things like that, it, is, it becomes physically impossible to scale the problem in such a way that I have to run wi- connect everything with wires, <laughs> right? Yeah, That's, yeah, absolutely. The, the wireless is not just about the, the pervasiveness of access, that that pervasiveness has a physical limitation if you have to wire. It's like, how many ethernet jacks do I have in my house? If, assuming yeah. you even have a house with ethernet jacks. Yeah, and, yeah. So well, that's just it. So I, I think if, if we go for these parts, you know, what, what, what's instructive about the past for what's going to be going on now and in the future? And then, you know, fundamentally, who is the edge for are really important. The, the answers to those questions are very sort of important to understand. And the past part being a, a, a big lesson I know we're taking forward on this is that, one, particularly in sort of the mobile space, that our, our advantage as, say, a mobile operator is not the presence is not, it's not what, what any of us ever say in the space. It's not the presence of specific locations. It's not, uh, it's not a latency story. It's uh, not, uh, you know, sovereignty things. It's not locality. It's not this, it's not that. The one thing that we have, other people won't have, are, are the mobile networks themselves. And so if we start with what, what can we anchor ourselves in from a mobility standpoint, do more than just providing connectivity should those things be. And so, for example, when you look at what's done today, and it's sort of number three from a traffic standpoint, but the oldest is voice. But it's a human talking to a human, but it is bidirectional. It's uh, conversational. It's relatively, you know, stable. I mean, people talk about it going up or down or anything else, but the the truth is, is if you if you set aside quote unquote voice revenue and you just look at how many minutes are people talking on cell phones to each other, the numbers actually continues to go up, you know, over time, even though a little bit. But you know, we speak to one another, and then. We also started messaging one another, starting from, you know, the evolution from SMS all the way up to, to WhatsApp. And we started messaging groups. It's whenever, whatever type messaging. And, that, and that's largely sort of number two of what you see going around. And then, you know, the absolute biggest thing that we do on our smartphones and anything that's on a, on a, on a mobile network, is we consume video. And, uh, you know, we watch video on it. So then one question for me is, that's a human being using a smartphone where there's voice media messaging and it's a human doing it with another human or a human doing it, you know, for, for themselves. Is there sort of a next step effort across each of those, those sort of areas? We see, for example, that humans have started talking to machines. Humans are actually using their voice as an input. And that's ranging from things like Amazon's Alexa and the Echoes and, and Siri on your phone and everything else. And we have good modern day examples of where that could go. 
you know, when you watch like the Iron Man movies and you see Tony Stark talking to Jarvis, right? It's Jarvis. Yeah, that little robot. Pretty clear that real time conversational conversation, you know, that's conversation with a machine that is witty and intelligent and everything else like that. But getting to that point where we're able to talk and use our voice, part of the user experience of what we're doing, and that it becomes vastly more conversational, the truth is, is that that requires capabilities and support in between the device and sort of in a public cloud. And then when we head into like the messaging equivalent, the messaging space, you know, everything we talk about from a uh, latency and the control system and how do we do this and how do we do that, all control systems and everything you see is, is messaging at the core of it, but it's meant to be highly reliable, scalable messaging. And, and right now in the device world, people can do peer to peer and relatively short pops over, you know, uh, radio protocols like Bluetooth and stuff like that. But if you want to move beyond one or two devices talking to one another and you want to move beyond sort of, you know, radio near peer to peer, you want to be able to scale, coordinate, reach consensus across hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices. So for example, like every automobile in a city understanding where every automobile is and, and, and so on like that. Then on the edge, we, we, don't, we don't need the ability for people to run low latency uh, workloads. Uh, we need the ability for them to have known latency interactions and the ability to use services there that help them scale and coordinate many on-device control systems, right? So, so there's a messaging analog. And then when you head into a video part that we're going from video consumption to then video camera being present on everything, we're switching from us consuming video and doing human vision to these devices generating video and the video coming in and needing to do computer vision you know, on that video. When you even look within that space, everything you could possibly be doing from existing smartphone type cameras and what's really needed to enable collaborative or multiplayer mixed reality experience or what's really needed in all the new devices ranging from glasses to drones to cars to other robotic systems each and every one of them is using cameras and video computer vision technologies to go and basically make decisions on what they should be doing and the like the idea that we'll have a tremendous amount of video coming in and if we can be part of that pipeline and part of that process where you have a whole set of computer vision heading into machine learning and other types of, of sort of technologies, that doing those in a way that can be fundamentally made available as a set of location aware and appropriate type edge services, that's clearly something that would be needed in, in sort of the future. And so I think we can look at what sort of happened today and we can just say, well, what if the end user changes from a human to another device? Uh, what if we sort of do this? And what if we sort of go do that? And we know how this sort of happened in the past. And I think we'll similar analogies to that happen in the future because we're making relatively small changes. We want to talk to a, a machine instead of a person. I want to deconstruct what you said and then take us in a little bit different direction, but because th there's a vision that you painted that, that resonates to me where homes have a lot of, you know, are starting to drop Alexas or smart devices. You can tell I don't have one because I said the name <laughs> in, in, in every room of their house. And so they can walk room to room and that's pretty voice response. You could yeah. easily imagine a video version where it's monitoring you in your room and then tracking what you're doing in it and could even better anticipate in every room the needs of the people in the room. But the amount of intelligence to do that is mind boggling. It's not something that you're going to have in your, in your closet or on your phone. It's going to be backhauled somewhere, which is where we start getting into these, these interesting devices. And it is one of these, as you said, it's one of these ones where uh, a relatively small group of people or some niche group of people, if you will, may be willing to 
spend a bit more money and compromise sort of right now and have a server closet in their house or something like that. However, the second a wireless, cordless, hands-free, nothing needed on-premise type experience that's easy to consume and, and seamless in, in how you're interacting with it will always replace something with cables and wires and has to be in your closet. That drives to me two, in, two interesting points. Um, one is that there actually will be an incentive for people besides the homeowner to pay for this non, non-housebound networking. I'm going to leave that for a second and come to, back to it because that's a phone company thing, which I know you, you, you're highly invested in. It also begs to an ecosystem question because mm-hmm. I, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think this is Amazon or some other device maker owning this whole space, right? This is, this is going to yep. be a, a multi-vendor environment. Is that a fair, fair assessment? Do you, I agree. So how do we build an ecosystem where I can bring multiple devices into my house or into my workplace or on my street mm-hmm and have them interact, share data. Is that, is that edge? Is, great. Where does that fit? Well, this is part of it, but great, great question. That, for example, you know, in the, in the home and consumer space, you know, the big mess there is that people are still anchored in hardware and hardware is always hard from that. And then the supporting of software on hardware long-term is difficult, you know, so that probably on average, a three-year-old, device you have in your house has probably been abandoned uh, by the maker. It's probably more likely to be running uh, malware than not, uh, you know, and and so on. But I just Um, rebooted my router like the NSA told me to do. Didn't that fix it? Is he technically the FBI that told you? But uh, ah, FBI. Yeah, the NSA never. NSA is probably upset that I did that. Yes. (laughs) So the ecosystem, right, these device, we're going to have all these legacy devices, very hard to change. The ecosystem is a software thing from that perspective? It, let's anchor it in the world's most popular device right now is still a smartphone, right? If you look at everything that's going on in the smartphone world and, and we ask what would be helpful if we did, you know, because if you think about it, for those of us that have mobile networks, you know, there's a, there's, a public, there's a public cloud sitting there. How you put things on a public cloud and how you distribute via public cloud is super clear, right? On the other end of it, how do I put my applications on smartphones and distribute it to a bunch of people? Super, super clear. clear. All the infrastructure that's in between those two things, all we do is provide connectivity between those two super clear, super easy to distribute ecosystems, right? Everything is sort of in between. Now, it's fair to say that we, what is it that somebody doing on a smartphone today that could require more than us just connecting those two things? most identifiable things are things where people are doing mixed reality or augmented reality on a smartphone. There's also then things where people are trying to have the same or a shared or a collaborative experience across many smartphones. So, you know, if you're, if 12 of you are playing the same mixed reality game or 12 of you or three of you, you know, an architect and a construction guy and the engineer are all using their smartphone at the same time to really see if this lines up with the blueprints in the building. Currently right now, because we have to open up a few APIs on the networking side and everything else like enable this in a series of, you know, quote unquote edge services is that currently right now collaborative or multiplayer or, these types of efforts around almost sort of vision intensive type things on your smartphone are not currently, not currently possible. So, so we're going to, we're going to tackle some things like that from the very beginning. And if, and if you stop and you think it does something very, to me, it does something very important for people. And that is right, right now, if you look at a, you know, let's say a dinner table with six people around it, they all have their phone out and they're all looking down at their phone if people can actually share and collaborate in a mixed reality way, then all their heads are going to go up and they're all going to be using that phone as a window to the world. And they're all going to be social now, you know, as a consequence of it, you know, you're going to be able to show people something in the middle there. You're going to be able to have some sort of the option of having a shared experience. But the thing I suggest you do, Rob, is grab, grab your phone 
you know, look down at it like you normally do, but then now hold it up like you're taking a picture. And once it's up, now imagine it being there for longer than a few minutes to take a picture. And then you start feeling the desire as a person to have that be hands-free. So the second those types of apps show up and those types of edge capabilities and those, the second people start holding that phone up for longer than it takes to take a picture <laughs> or a 30 second video, then they're gonna want it hands-free. And hands-free means that the mixed reality experience should move to the glasses. You know what I mean? Not, not reading your email, not looking at a website, nothing like that, but it justifies that part of what the smartphone does the mixed reality part can move to a hands-free experience on your face. And then we can focus on glasses that don't do what Google glass did and don't do this and don't do that. And it's not about reading the web and shit. It's about just the mixed reality sort of part of it and making that very sort of compelling. But the mixed reality, but the mixed reality experience, the thing that's very distinctive to me is it's a network experience because your phone doesn't have all, or I don't anticipate it having, correct me if, if, you, if you disagree, having all of the data, even within your house, that, it, that you would actually want in an augmented view. That data is gonna be coming from all sorts of additional devices. Yeah, I mean, the fact, the fact that it's just meant to be a social, shared, collaborative, multiplayer experience means that that experience is coming from networking. Right, so you have very intensive visual overlay processing and all of the inputs as you scan that environment, it's gonna be pulling back and saying, oh, this is a sensor, this is my thermostat, this is my refrigerator, this is another person, yep. this is my television. I have to overlay data that I've aggregated from those sources into that, into that space, right? And that's, yep. that's not a, there's no amount of, it's not a processing problem. That doesn't, yep. you know, we could have little supercomputers on our phone. It's, it's actually a network sharing problem, which is, I think, where, where you've been, you know, we've, we've sort of been walking towards this very broadly. It's yeah. the, the ecosystem is a data ecosystem. It's sort of the, that's the impression I'm getting from you, right? It's a, yeah, and, I, and, I, and, I've, and I've been trying to, I've been, you know, spending just a lot of time thinking about the, you know, a realistic human drive to, you know, because of course, you know, the funny part is like, if there's, if there's a need on a consumer or an enterprise side and there's a need on a device side, it's new and it's interesting and it's compelling and people want it and everything else like that, building out, you know, doing all the investments we have to do on the 5G side are obvious. Just like, you know, there's, there's conversations 2005, 6, 7 and so on of what, why, why would we ever do a 4G, why would we do an LTE in sort of the mobile space? And then the iPhone showed up and it became obvious for everybody. Oh my God, we gotta hurry up and do LTE. But people forget that 11 years ago, the idea that somehow something is, something like LTE would be needed was just, was just sort of ridiculous. And then you know, you, we, we had a tremendous amount of effort there. And, and, and I think for me, if we can get people to stop staring down at their iPhones and lift their heads up and use those iPhones as a window to the world where they're doing something with other people in it. If we can get them to do that, then there's actually a set of literally about a dozen different services we got to present up. The place that they would be physically running is what a lot of us refer to as quote unquote, the edge from that perspective. And it's the first step and then sitting and saying, ah, okay, well, then they're gonna want that to be hands-free. So it's gonna justify the appearance of smart glasses, if you will. Right. Then they're gonna want those glasses to not have to be tethered to a phone. So then it's gonna justify then bringing that sort of experience directly to the glasses. All the back end that's, all the back ends that are required to do that then are the same back ends that would be needed to then have the same type of large scale video ingest from a body cam. <laughs> or in-house security cam or you know, drones or sort of anything else like that. So then we head into having the, the realistic sort of back-end capabilities that we need to support all the other types of, of devices we talk about, whether it be robotics, cars, things like this. You know, and, and I think, you know, even if we go back to the very beginning, I mean, the only time we run, you know, if I was telling you right now that like the killer edge use case is going to be a fully autonomous vehicle, 
right? And everything that's required to have fully autonomous vehicles sort of going around and doing it, that's something that's 15 years out. But I think this first act of just getting people to look up from their phones and be with each other. Your use cases, though, I'm connecting some dots with this because the especially with the with the cameras and drones, right? We had we had another podcast with Hangar where they talked about uh, for you has an air jet, but this, in this other other podcast we talk about drones and it, the killer app. Interestingly, in a lot of what you're identifying is battery life, right? Physics physics is hard. And so the likelihood of us solving battery longevity before we fixed network latency in 5G is, is zero. And so maybe something close to zero. And so everything you're describing, cars, glasses, drones, putting enough batteries to drive processors to make them do this interesting, these interesting applications isn't going to work. We have to... It's not a matter of offloading the processor because we, we don't have the processors. We're offloading the processors because we don't have the batteries. Correct. Um, yeah. And, and see, the thing is, isn't so if we can, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things happening in, you know, the telecom space anyways. A ton of infrastructure transformations end to end. And there's been a lot of focus on taking cost out and, and these sorts of things and getting ready to modernize LTE to get ready for 5G and convert to our cores and you know, all the typical sort of things that you hear, you know, from, from that perspective. And then what we spent a lot of time on here, you know, as you said, in our, in our, in our little stealth mobile edge X company is just, okay, if we look at like what we have right now, who are the large users and what are the most common devices and what's sort of here and there, you know, what, what are, what are the, uh, three, then six, then nine, then 12, then 15 developer facing edge services we can do right now and then again and then again and again in a very sort of short period of time that are these types of building blocks for this magical future that many people sort of pref- seem to prefer to market. You know, the, the truth is, is if we can, a number of things that we can do that you know do, doesn't doesn't actually require a business case to go and do or doesn't require another infrastructure investment to go and do it just requires us to it's required us to go out and just be a bit more empathetic than we have been in the past you know c- commit to sort of launching a few things in there so, so i think we've there's a good decent pragmatic view i think on what would be done in the edge space over the next, you know, three months, six months, nine months, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, and so on. That perspective with, from, you know, from your perspective, that means networking, network topologies, the interconnectedness of things become sort of the, the driving impetus. Is that, I'm, I'm trying to pull back the mobile. No, because, it, no, because at the same time, I can't stand, I, I don't think the, I've never, I've never liked, I've never liked the uh, uh, networking vendor, telco vendor, telco people. I've never liked the whole idea that the network is everything and connectivity is everything and stuff like that. Uh, not, okay. Not at all. I mean, you know, because, uh, you know, I, you I guess I'm, I'm taking your, your, your Deutsche Telekom no, 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 no. We, 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 ship and, and trying to give you the layup and, and you're, yeah. you're uh, rebounding yourself. All right. Let's, no, no, because what I mean is you know, even, even what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about when we say that we're going to go and ex- say expose the topology of where things are to people so they can place it better. That's a data stream. That's not a network API. That's a data feed for people, right? There's a a number of things where, uh, you know, for helping people with, uh, you know, fraud issues or helping them sort of here. So the, the reality is we have to go from a network centric view of these types of things to an exceptionally data centric view of it. And this, this is, this is about both, capturing and exposing and sort of making possible largely a, a number of data feeds that then allow people to make decisions with that, do something that's helpful and, and, and so on. So I, I think it's, it's just the opposite where it's going to be all about data. Oh, so this is the S this is the S three equivalent for the edge in some ways. You're at, you were watching Amazon 10 years ago, 12 years ago and thinking, Oh, it's yeah, this S three thing. Yeah. It's, who cares? And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you wake up one day and that you realize that they nailed the fundamental first building block and everybody else missed it. You're saying data, edge data is going to be one of those. Well, yeah, I mean, I I just, I just recall having like, 
a bigger footprint and better customers and a better product than they had let somehow losing. I had some time to reflect on that. And, and part of it was, <laughs> I, I had, was, I had, I was, I was doing cloud at the same, at the same time back in with Dave McCrory back in our, our pro tier. Well, and we used to, I mean, we all made fun of Amazon. Yes. It, so we all, and API only and, very middle customer experience. Yep. Like, they don't even have a portal, you know? <laughs> so, and if you go, if you go back then, we have to remember the, the very first, the very first thing that came out, very first thing that came out was uh, def pay. So the payment part and call that the, the uptime of the payment API was shit. It was like, you know, 95, 90, sort of 6%. And yeah. so the, the next Amazon web service that came out was simple queue service with the use case where you're queuing your API request to this not so good sort of death pay API. And then I remember when, when S3 came out, uh, you know, the, the, some of the first use case on it was <laughs> store your logs from things like simple queue service and death pay because it's a payment service. Right. So, so, so I, I want to so, think about it. And then the first EC2 use case is like process the logs, you know, so you can sort of like figure out sort of like what it is. And two, I can, t- I can tell you that, you know, on reflection, uh, because I, it was funny because I understood both these things because we, we had a decent amount of email infrastructure as well. And then mm-hmm. other sort of things. So I, I had people that had been working for years on large scale email systems and people that worked on large scale email systems know how to do very distributed hash directory structures that would like perfectly put 16,000 small files across an array of 32,000 folders across exactly sort of this. And they would like perfectly go fill up, say a bunch of net apps with the perfect sort of hash directory structure of all these great little individual files. And then you have WordPress, Ruby on rails, uh, Django, turbo gears, every sort of web framework in there. And each one of them was like slash home, slash rails, slash app, slash assets. You know, there would be things like some of the big outages, some of the big early outages at Twitter was because they had three, three million images in slash assets. And so you, know, you get to the point where, and, and you know, by the way, if you attempted to do that in any traditional storage environment, like a NetApp or an EMC at the time, it would barf all over it the second you tried to put the 32,001 image on there. So then I said, oh my God, you know, these guys, unlike our email guys, these web guys, they don't know how to do distributed hash directory structures for these little profile pictures they have and these little this and these little that. All the early outages of a Twitter and all these guys, all of them came down to their inability to handle logs and their inability to handle small little pictures because they stuck it in one big folder. And so, you know, S3 showed up. And oddly enough, solved the two number one reasons for like web 2.0 downtime. And that was they had logs fill up servers and they stuck all their, all their, all their images and shit in one folder, one directory. And, and, uh, and this, to, this, this, is, this to me is one of the gems of the conversation, right? We are looking at edge and we think we know what the problem is. And we have a tendency to think it has, to, we have to solve it in, in a great way. And the lessons you're describing are, we probably don't really know what the real problem is yet. Maybe, yeah. maybe you do, um, maybe, but it, you know, we, may, we might not know. And the chances are that the solution for it won't look as elegant as we all think it needs to be, that it might just be right. No, like we, we you know, we've, right. we, we, yeah, and we, we've been running around some examples in the space. And the question I've been asking a lot of the product team is, it's like, oh, that I, I like that because that that sounds like a complete bullshit reason for for why they were down recently. Now, oh, okay, we can we can solve that with an edge service, <laughs> you know. So, and that's I you know I think that these are very real. Not to continue with my obsession around the success of AWS, I don't want it to sound that way, but, <laughs> yeah. but they but they persisted from that standpoint in the sense of. Uh, EC2 comes out and it's like, here's how to convert one image into another image and here's how to process your logs. And then remember right. what people started doing it, doing with it were the, was these elaborate, elaborate use of EC2 simple queue service and S3 as a way of like running a MySQL database on there yeah. where everything's transient, but you know, boom, 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 here's automated sort of recovery of this event happens and stuff like that. And then lo and behold, the next service that comes out is the relational database service. Building blocks and APIs 
let communities build. It's right. This is, yep. I think, where we where we see things going. I know Stephen's about to throw flags on the field for me to, to to stop asking you questions. But there was a topic we talked about in pre that I wanted to get get a, a expound for, and maybe we'll, we'll we'll throw it in the in a, a as a postscript. Yep. Um, but you had talked about hardware, which everybody knows is near and dear to my heart, yep. uh, and booting, which is even closer to my heart. Oh yeah. Um, Still being stuck in the 80s. Uh, 80s? Maybe, maybe 90s, 70s. I, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, you, you can't throw me raw meat without, without me remembering <laughs> and coming back. Hardware boot. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know if you re- recall, but I mean, probably, I mean, there's one time in the past when joint Microsoft Google started, because remember, joint was like a third owned by Intel. So we started hammering Intel where we wanted to do openfirmware.org, open boot. We wanted, mm. wanted to, to sort of take a totally different approach. I mean, the, the fundamental thing is that opening up everything down there fundamentally runs up against Intel trying to protect some code that would be needed that if you have the code, then supposedly you can reverse engineer a part of x86, blah, 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 blah. Interesting. So the ability to fix that issue runs up against Intel NDAs, their non-interest in ever having that that fix. So, and I mean, I mean, literally, when you think about something that us and Microsoft and Google literally got, I mean, we were doing joint conversations with them, sort of about it'd be really nice to take a totally different approach to bringing a system up and doing this and doing that. It'd be really great if we could hear. And so was, this was things where, you know, we had managed to eradicate most issues for downtime except for uh, the only issue, the only pretty much like post, I think probably two, post 2000, you know, by 2008, 2009, I mean, the only, only, only production issues we ever had were firmware issues. And so we, we started on a complete, and by the way, that's not unique to us. It's also, you. Uh, that's firm, no, that's firm, the firmware. Same. That's the same inside of a, you know, Google or problem. Like that as well. So, so we went down this whole effort of wanting to completely minimize that, sort of take a different approach, sort of do everything else, but it runs up against uh, some uh, odd things. Firmware is is one of those edge problems that's very significantly solved in incredibly snowflake ways. Data center firmware, even though it's relatively standard because of the, the Intel monopolies, is still incredibly hard to create any repeatable process for. And, and um, I, I, I look, I had this, I had this happen, you know, you know, a couple, a couple years ago when say, you know, oldest daughter was, you know, say three years ago, oldest daughter is, you know, 14 and she's really doing this. And she's like, daddy, I think I'm going to go out and try out for the Olympic, you know, team for, you know, great. great. What do you want to do after you do that? She's like, I'm going to be a firmware engineer. <laughs> The whole conversation was made up. By heart. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing true about any of that. Any, anything <laughs> said that. That's something a child never says. I'm working on my kids to be nuclear scientists and go sit on submarines for a life so I don't have to hear from them for six months. <laughs> and uh, they just don't know that's why I'm working them over. <laughs> Do even better at extra extra planetary. That latency from Mars is a is a killer. I know, but I haven't seen the rockets go yet. But I know there's so. no. It's 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 fine. But uh, getting them hooked on drugs and refusing to give them money—that's also a way to make them stop talking to you. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> well, I think we've uh, gone over that. I'm going well, to leave sure. my ankle bracelet <laughs> off. <laughs> so, so Jason, I was on your website for Mobile Edge X, and uh, uh, so there's a place to, to let me check into, with Jeff. Do we have a website? Into your name, yeah. and uh, so I'm on your list, and I encourage our listeners to uh, go out there and add their name as well, so they can get information. In the meantime, uh, any other ways just to follow you? I assume you're on Twitter. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jason H on Twitter. Jason H on Twitter. Well, great. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us today. It was a great conversation, and I'm sure in a couple of months we'll bring you back in. I, Rob, we're getting to the point where we have to start bringing some people back in. We've we been running for a year now, which is quite shocking. Anyway, well, thanks again, Jason, and uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much.